Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Rover, and um, I'm the Assistant Principal here at Mars to Cogra. So today we're going to look at religion and non-religion. Can I just start by saying that if you have any questions, if you put them in that Q&A, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you, and I'll answer them um, at a later date, and I'll attach them to the end of this PowerPoint. So the aims of our session today are several. Firstly, we'll look at the syllabus and look at the learn to statements um, and the importance of the, the verbs in those learn to statements. We're going to explore the 2021 HSC um, multiple choice questions and how to answer multiple choice questions, analyse a few past HSC five markers, question 22, and how to answer short answer questions, look at some ways to organise our study notes and then some helpful hints, hopefully. Um, the first part of the syllabus, all our outcomes, I, I might leave that. I think um, the skills that are there are fairly evident, but let's take a look at the content statements. So um, there are several bigger headings. So the religious dimension in history is the, is the first one. Here we're asked to identify the following expressions of religious dimension in human history. So we look at animism, polytheism and monotheism. We're asked to identify those. So that means we're talking about recognising them, being able to name them, maybe give a few features of them. Our next one is to evaluate the place of the religious dimension in human history. Um, enabling um, the religious dimension to provide meaning and purpose for individuals, social cohesion and social transformation. Evaluating, making some sort of judgment about whether religious dimension has provided those things in human history. And then we're asked to investigate statistical data on the current global distributions of our five major religious traditions. Um, so we're asked to inquire about those and to draw conclusions about those things. Our next big heading is about new religious expressions and about recognising the reasons for the rise in new religious expressions. Um, people's idea of searching for what they believe to be personal fulfilment, um, seeking ethical guidelines and to seek clarity or clarification in their relationships with society. So we're asked to recognise, that means to identify um, as something, to, to, you know, to be able to... Um, no, I suppose, no, those things. The next thing is to explain how the following have influenced the growth of new religious expressions and spiritualities. So looking at the cause and effect, making relationships between things. So has been a growth in new religious expressions and spiritualities. Um, what, what has caused that? So the rise of materialism, scientific progress, the growth of ecological awareness, or people's disenchantment with traditional religious traditions. We then move on to new religions, religious worldviews, non-religious worldviews, um, looking at the main features of the essential features of an atheist, an agnostic, to outline the positions of a rational humanist, a scientific humanist, discuss how agnosticism, atheism and humanism determine the aspirations and behaviours of individuals. So to identify, to provide the points um, for and against those things. We then look at the difference between religious and non-religious worldviews. We compare those, compare those under the headings of the concept of the transcendent, the human person and social responsibility. Um, I'm not sure how people put their notes together, but um, the students that I teach often have lots of notes. And so there's a link to this um, spreadsheet sort of thing um, that I would give the students in my class to, to be able to write some of their notes in. Obviously, they're not their first lot of notes. They might have written a whole lot of things out of their textbook or from what's happened in class, but to make them succinct and to the point so that they had only maybe one or two pieces of paper that they would take with them that would then jog in their memories um, some important facts about the content in religion and non-religion. And I have to say, there's a tremendous amount of content in religion and non-religion. The material that's on these slides probably doesn't amount to um, the information that people, students would be given in class, but maybe it might help. So what do we need to know? Um, I think the first thing we need to understand is this notion of a worldview. Um, it's the lens through which we look at the world. 
Um, so myself, a religious person, I, I'm affiliated with a religious tradition. So some of the decisions that I make would be based on my religious background. If I was a non-religious person, then I wouldn't have the same, um, the same grounding. So we've got two lots of worldviews. We've got our religious one and we've got our non-religious worldview. Somebody who had a non-religious worldview may very well not be celebrating Easter. Um, whereas a person with a religious worldview might have their whole family together at Easter time. So if we go to our first heading, which was about the religious dimensions um, in human history. So religion has had a part to play in history um, from the beginning of, you know, people. So we're asked to identify animism, polytheism and monotheism. I'm sure that many people are familiar with those terms. If we look at animism, it's a belief in the existence or activity of spirits in all sorts of things, in mountains, in rivers. Um, our Indigenous community have this notion too. The Japanese um, religion of Shinto, they would believe these sorts of things that the spirit beings, if we would like to call them those, there is a belief that there are spirits in, in our um, landscapes and in other things too, in, in other objects as well. Polytheism, monotheism, sorry, it's the belief in one God. So our three traditional um, religions of Islam, Judaism and Christianity, they all, all of the adherents in those particular religious traditions believe in one God. Polytheism is a belief in many gods and um, Hindu religious tradition, Buddhism, the Romans and the ancient Greeks all had many gods that they worshipped. Um, and maybe you've gone into a little bit of detail into um, specific examples of, of those three um, groups within history. We then have the significance of the religious dimension. So we're evaluating the, the place that religion has for providing meaning and purpose to individuals, social cohesion and social transformation. Um, so religion has given individuals and society um, meaning and purpose. How does it do that? Well, it provides an individual with a sense of belonging and identity. I remember reading some information about groups of people that were, were um, having mental health issues. And there was a really large proportion of those people who had issues and weren't affiliated with a religious tradition. And that might be just one group that you may be affiliated with, with but it gives you that sense of belonging and identity. Using sacred texts to provide answers to those questions about the meaning of life. So um, religion has posed answers to some of those questions. Where did the universe come from? Um, what happens when I die? Um, why do bad things happen to people? So some of the writings of our sacred texts have provided interpretation about the meaning of life. Providing guidelines for adherence on how to live a good life and to achieve the goals of the religious tradition. And those goals might be different for different religious traditions. Um, celebrating important events in a person's life. So the birth of someone, the marriage of someone, the death of someone, those are all um, rites of passage and religions have a, a big part to play in the celebration of those things. Providing adherence with an understanding of the beliefs and practices of the tradition. So the adherents that belong to this tradition all have a key set of beliefs and a key, key um, set of practices that belong to that tradition. And they do it with other people. Assisting an adherent with others uh, and others with social welfare. So for religion for a long time has had a part to play in social welfare domains, helping those people that were less fortunate or more vulnerable than ourselves. Instructing an adherent in methods of meditation and prayer, which may help them to achieve those goals of tradition. So, for example, in Christianity, we may be talking about building a relationship with our God. And so methods of meditation and praying help us to achieve that goal. Um, providing role models to assist the adherent in a good life. So in our religious traditions, there would be um, significant people 
that have given us a better understanding of our religious tradition and a better understanding of how to live a good life. What is social cohesion? So social cohesion is, is um, bringing society together, uniting us under a common cause or a set of values and beliefs. And religion has, paid a, has had a part to play in doing those things. So how does religion create social cohesion? By providing a society with the laws based on the ethical traditions found in um, the sacred texts. So in Australia, our laws are based on really Christian principles, and that was probably from the beginning of, um, you, you know, the, the first fleet coming to Australia, um, we had a set of beliefs that we brought with us from the United Kingdom. And today those laws are still in place. Acting as advocates on behalf of disadvantaged groups in society. So we have um, groups like St Vincent de Paul in our Catholic tradition, who would help those people and, and bring those people together to be part of that group if they were unable to do that themselves. Providing themes for painting and structure, architecture, music. Um, many of our Gothic churches all have similar sorts of, they were places of worship and they have very similar sorts of architecture, um, similar sorts of statues around the churches and the cathedrals um, and that all came out of a certain time in history um, and often that was related in those cases to our religious traditions. Providing the impetus for communal action. So in Islam, for example, um, the Hajj brings Islamic people together from all over the world and that's part of the one of the great things to, of the Hajj is that it does bring people from all parts of the world um, to come together under the banner of Islam and submission to the will of Allah. Um, providing rituals in times of disaster. So I know when um, the Twin Towers in New York were um, terrorised, and when many other things have happened in our world where there has been um, people that have been displaced or there has been um, a great amount of uncertainty for humanity, um, people get together. Their religions bring people together. We might have, um, I think it was when we had our, those terrible shootings in the centre of Sydney, um, religious groups came together and pray for those people. So those sorts of things bring society and bring people together. Social transformation is, is different to social cohesion. It's about um, the means by which a society or sections of society are altered to create new structures or points of view. Um, so how do, okay, how do we do that? So, we're challenging society to reconsider its values and the way it treats people. And I think religious leaders from all different religious traditions do that very often. If we see that there seems to, seems to be some sort of injustice um, for people, often people that are marginalised, then we speak up. And I suppose reconciliation with our Indigenous Australians um, is an area where our religious traditions in Australia have spoken out about injustice. And, and have made things change. I suppose another example of that um, closer to home would have been when our governments were um, discussing funding for um, the independent sector for religious schools. And religious schools made a very loud voice about some of these things. And so some of the ways in which the government um, gives money to or funding to educational sectors changed as a result of, of very loud voices speaking out from religious leaders. Um, supporting public morality in the early days or of the 1900s and we had um, we had shopping centres and activities that didn't happen on a Sunday morning and people spoke because Sunday morning was the time when we went to worship. Um, we had a time where there was a little bit of abuse around alcohol and gambling and some of the family values um, religious leaders believed were dissipating. So we had a group of um, our religious leaders spoke out about those sorts of things and condemned some of those things which brought people together. Preventing societies and cultures from receiving the benefits of advances in medicine and technology and science, because these new ideas are seen as opposing significant central beliefs. 
So sometimes it may not be a positive outcome, but it might be a bit of a negative outcome. So in the days of Darwin and his theories of evolution, um, people saw that as heresy, that it wasn't the right thing to be believing. And so um, it opposed the church views. And I suppose people of religious groups um, came together over those things, but it also separated society because there were the, the people who believed and the people who didn't believe. Sometimes there might be a little bit of a negative, a negative turn to that as well. And our crusades, um, the, the crusades that happened um, earlier on in the in the history, our history, um, they were times where maybe there was division within um, our religious traditions and society. Next, um, our next dot point is around investigating statistical data around global distribution of the five religious traditions. Now, this, this data was the data that I had in one of our textbooks, and I've acknowledged that. I'm not sure if there's anything that's more up to date. I did Google it, and I, I struggled um, to find anything that was up to date, more up to date. Um, I feel like this is something where um, the the HSC paper, um, you would be aware that you have 10 multiple choice around this unit of work. And uh, at times, I think some of those multiple choice questions are extremely difficult. And it's, it's a bit hit and miss whether you will be able to get the answer correct. So I would say that the students that I teach roughly learn where those colours are and what those colours mean. And there's a whole lot of different maps. But if you understand that around America, there seems to be lots of Christianity. Um, if you were to look at Africa, the bottom part of Africa is Christian, but the top part of Africa um, and into Saudi Arabia are all Islamic countries. So if you sort of got a, a general idea about where the five major religions seem to be centered, um, I think that will set you in good stead. Um, it's also important to understand um, how many of, or, or the order in which I suppose, that our religious, five major religious traditions are prominent. So I like to learn things with tables. So I've set up a table um, from the most prominent to the least prominent. And this, this we're talking about is world um, religious traditions. So our first one would be Christianity, Islam, Hindu, Buddhism and then Judaism and I've given you some names of some places in the world where predominantly um, those religious traditions are the uh, majority. So I would suggest that you learn something like this um, but as I said sometimes they name countries and say which of these four countries might have had the greatest majority Christian and you know one of those choices might be quite difficult for you. Um, new religious expression. So the right, the, this part of the syllabus is around the rise of new religious expressions and spirituality. So we're looking at the reasons why new religious expressions have grown. And our reasons are threefold. One, there's a search for personal fulfillment. So our traditional religious religions no longer provide personal fulfillment to the adherent. We seek ethical guidelines and in seeking, in seeking ethical guidelines. And sometimes science and religion come to loggerheads um, and to seek the clarity of our relationship within society. So once again, tables, I've taken some of these tables from a great book that set out um, tables, I thought. Um, as I said, I think it's, it's easy to learn and to um, put your information together, your notes together when you do use tables. Um, so searching for personal fulfillment. What's the relationship between this and the rise of new religious expressions? So as I said before, people are dissatisfied with traditional forms of religion. Um, we've talked for a very long time about poor people, but we still have those um, marginalised people on our streets. And people would say, well, what are we doing about that? So they've, they've had enough. Of, it's not giving them their personal fulfilment. Hierarchical structures are failing to provide the individual with sufficient say in important matters. So sometimes our hierarchy and some of our religious traditions um, may be male. Um, they may, we may feel like we don't have a voice or the adherents may feel like they don't have a voice. Um, and so that asks people the question about, should I be part of this? 
provide women with inferior roles in administration and decision making and do not meet the lived experience of youth in worship and guidance. Um, and some religion, religious traditions work really hard on trying to um, gain um, youth and involve the youth in, in whatever activity there is that they are doing. But for some people, that isn't um, their way of finding personal fulfillment. And we appear to offer unachievable goals and unrealistic expectations on individuals. So sometimes some of our, um, some of our ethical issues may not seem um, in light of our religious ethical guidelines, may not match up. And so people decide that that religious tradition was not for me and I need to find something that fulfills me more. Another thing is around seeking ethical guidelines, and I think I just touched on that, that tradi traditional ethical responses can be seen as restrictive, um, especially with respect to some modern ethical issues, which are quite complex at times. Modern scientific and um, technological advances, sometimes religions don't seem to, religious traditions don't seem to keep up to date with new discoveries and scientific advancements, things around embryonic research, for example is an area where religion may differ greatly um, from public opinion or the secular world. Seeking to clarify their relationship with society. So new sexualities and lifestyles have given many people in the modern world a new understanding of who they are. And that might not fit in with their traditional um, religious tradition. Opposition to male hierarchies in, in religious traditions, and some people see scientific revolution and technological advances to threaten, um, threatening, threatening, and they don't actually understand them. So that makes the gap between them and their religious tradition quite large. And there is greater concern by people regarding ecological awareness, and they may not think that their religious tradition is meeting that need as well. I think in those questions, if I was to go back, um, the most important thing is if there is a question that asks you something about for the reasons why we have a rise in new religious expression, it's those three things. I suppose the material on the other side of the table is, is the um, explaining of it. Influences on the growth of new religious um, expressions and spiritualities. So we have to explain how the following have influenced the growth of new religious expressions and, and spiritualities, how the rise of materialism has affected that, how scientific progress has, the growth of ecological awareness and disenchantment with traditional religious practices and guidelines. And I would suggest there that you needed to have an example of a new religious expression or spirituality, <coughs> I'm sorry, to put in um, your answer. In five mark questions, which you get the 10 multiple choice and a five mark question, it's really important to have examples in your five markers. So once again, the rise of materialism. So how does that contribute to a dissatisfaction by adherence? So adherence might see that there therefore is a denial in their spiritual dimension. That material wealth and accumulating possessions has taken over from their spirituality. And that in doing that, there seems to be a disintegration of traditional values where people might have stayed at home and had a Sunday lunch because of this, this idea of accumulating wealth um, and they might have gone to church together, then had their lunch. The idea of that not happening anymore seems to be um, people would, some people would see it as a breakdown of traditional values. Um, how we might provide support they may provide support for new religious traditions. So how can the rise of materialism do that? It can do that by acknowledging a spiritual dimension and seeking to fulfil that in a non-traditional way. So some people might move to some sort of ecologically aware um, new religious expression or spirituality, and in doing that, that's fulfilled that spiritual dimension for them and it might have something to do with nature, um, and um, the way nature exists. And so those people get that spirituality from that. 
and it's not necessarily a traditional way of our five major religious traditions. Believe that material prosperity is not necessary for personal fulfillment. So that you don't need to have all this wealth um, or accumulation of possessions to have personal fulfillment. And it might be around um, seeking closer relationships with others and the value of humanity. Scientific progress, um, if we were talking about dissatisfaction, it would be around there's no place for the divine or the spiritual um, in this explanation. Technologies have to a certain extent endangered species. Science for some people is difficult to understand. Um, sometimes it's a whole lot of language that people aren't familiar with and so they don't understand it. Um, some results of science appear to be a threat to humanity. So um, I suppose some of the commentary around genetic engineering, cloning, stem cell research, some of those things, um, some people are not privy to understanding that language and so it becomes quite threatening to humanity. How can it provide support? Well, scientific progress is acknowledging the, could be acknowledging the limitations of science and the existence of some sort of supernatural realm. Humanity needs to remain independent from technologies. We seek a holistic explanation for complex personal and global issues, and we're seeking greater reverence um, for humanity. Um, another reason is this growth of ecological awareness um, and how might that contribute to dissatisfaction. Um, abuse of natural resources, extinction of plants and animals, we've seen humanity do this. So do we need to continue to see humanity do this or do we um, move onto something different because the religious tradition that I belong to, a religion, doesn't seem to be doing having a part to play in trying to um, make this situation better. Threats of pollution, global warming, lack of water, all those things people have a, a much greater awareness of and what is our religious tradition doing about those things? Results of overpopulation in some geographical regions have caused great um, disturbance to the environment and is that something that we want to continue to keep doing? How might the growth of ecological awareness then provide support for new religious expressions? So there's an acceptance of interconnection between humans and nature. We're developing lifestyles that avoid pollution and environmental damage and an acceptance of this responsibility of stewardship, that we are all responsible for this earth and for humanity. Many adherents disenchanted with traditional religions why ethical ideas may seem restricted. They may seem um, not up to date with what's happening in our contemporary world. Rituals may no longer be relevant. Um, there may be restrictive authority, I suppose, around issues of ethics might be one area where our religious tradition tells us one thing or guides us in one way, but secular society might say something different. Lacking inclusivity, um, do our religious traditions support the young, ethnic minorities, women, et cetera? And that may be something that um, causes an adherent to be dissatisfied with their religious tradition. So how might disenchantment with, religious, with traditional religions provide support for new religious expressions or spirituality? Um, new ethical responses to contemporary issues. Creation of rituals that are seen to complement modern views and lifestyles. Um, shared responsibility and equal participation in authority. Do we have a voice? They may have a voice in this religious expression or spirituality and the idea of inclusivity. Now, in a question, you wouldn't put all of that down. Um, you might just pick one or two things that belong to each of those reasons and give those as your supporting answer. Um, now we look at non-religious worldview. So the things that we've spoken about before are about religious worldviews. Now let's have a look at those non-religious worldviews. So an agnostic, an atheist, and a humanist. And we need to be able to outline the essential features of each of those non-religious worldviews. So an atheist or atheism is a belief that there is no God. And what are some of the features of that? Um, reliance on the individual to explore and explain the natural world only. There's a lack of deity, of the transcendent doesn't exist. 
there's a focus on the individual and the collective destiny of humankind. Ethical behaviour is determined by the individual and based on the common good. Um, I know that when I've been studying, um, talking to the students that I teach around ethics, I would say that if somebody doesn't belong to a religious worldview, they belong to a non-religious worldview, are they moral? Do they have, what is their ethical compass? And it would be this notion of, of common good in humanity. Absence of organised rituals, and there is no central symbol or text. In religious traditions, we go to texts, sacred texts or writings um, to, to find guidance. For an atheist, they're going to have to find some other way. An agnostic is a person that cannot prove either that God exists or that God does not exist. So once again, there's a reliance on, reliance on the individual to explore and explain the natural world. Humanity needs to do that. Um, there are none of those questions that can't be answered. They should be able to be answered. Impossible to know whether the transcendent exists. Not sure whether it does or whether it doesn't, but it's impossible to know that. There's a focus on the individual and the collective destiny of humankind. Ethical behaviour is once again determined as it would be for an atheist um, based on the common good. And there's an absence of organised rituals, no um, central symbols or text. Then we have our humanists, and our humanists believe in humanity, in the human person, and in reason and logic. And there are two sorts of humanists that we're asked to look at, rational humanists and scientific humanists. And I think by the name of the second lot of humanists, you would guess that they have something to do with science and experimentation. So a rational humanist the human mind is capable of finding the truth. That humanity, we can use our brains and we can find out how these things work. It might take us a long time, but we can do that. The proper study for humans is humanity, not uncertain supernatural forces. Acknowledges the contribution of all cultures and societies to discover the truth, not just Western philosophy. So we look at a whole range of contributing cultures and um, knowledge bases. There is no gender hierarchy. Both males and female minds are able to discover the truth. Similarly, it's, um, it's similar to, I'm not sure why that one was there, um, to a, a rational humanist and a scientific humanist are both similar to in, in both those respects. And then there's the dismissal of supernatural miracles or non-verifiable -verif ideas. So it needs to be proved. Um, and if we go back to looking at the definition, it's saying that the belief that human reason alone is the means of building a society based on the central value of humanity, the dignity of every person, logical thinking to whom determines the behaviours that make such a society possible. So a belief in humanity and in the ability of humanity and we look at our logic and reason. We're talking about scientific humanism, then it's very similar to rational humanists, but incorporates a study of scientific research and experimentation that can prove these things and human behaviour to explain the existence and to determine the means of developing a just society based on the dignity of every person. So it's similar to the rational humanists. However, there's a focus clearly on experimentation and proving things. It asserts the ultimate ability of science to systemise all truth so we can prove all these things and we can make these happen because of our experimentation and our scientific research. Um, and it uses deductive reasoning and scientific method. So we're then asked to discuss how agnostics, atheists and humanists determine the aspirations and behaviours of individuals. So they use their own resources in order to achieve their own goals. Ethical behaviour is determined by an individual's own understanding of what is good and what is bad. Ethical assistance and guidance is based on advancement, and knowledge brought about by modern science. Important events in an individual's life are celebrated secularly. 
The individual sees this life as the only opportunity to achieve their goals. And if the person values human life, then part of um, their life would be able to improve the lives of others. We then asked to compare a religious worldview and a non-religious worldview. Um, and under these headings, the concept of the transcendent, what would a religious person think and what would a non-religious person be thinking about the human person and about social responsibility, so our obligation to humanity. Um, so if we looked at, I just picked Christianity, but you can pick any of the religious traditions that you studied. So what is, a so Christianity in this case, what is Christianity's concept of the transcendent? There is a belief in one God who is all-knowing and eternal. There is an afterlife, and that is not within this universe, so it's somewhere outside. There's a belief in the soul that transcends matter and universe, and that God's presence is experienced by a person. What would Christianity say about a human person? The human person is made up of a body, a mind, and soul. The human has spiritual destiny. The human is able to reason, but requires divine revelation for full truth. So we're using those messages of our tradition to ensure that we are guided truthfully. The human must behave in accordance with divine will. So what would a Christian think about social responsibility? It would be, you know, love thy neighbour as thyself would be paramount. Ethical responsibility towards others. So because I'm part of this Christian group, I have an obligation to support those people who are marginalised or, or in, um, in need. We need to perform acts of charity and the duty to contribute justly and meaningfully to society. If I was a humanist, what would I be saying about these things? So I would be saying that there's no proof for the transcendent beyond the universe. Some speculations of, um, you know, that there could be other universes and people are investigating those things. There is no proof of life after death and there is no proof of a soul. Show me that soul. Where is it? What evidence do you have? to say that, that a human has a soul. What, what might we say about human person, the human person? The body's made up of cells and atoms. There's no proof for the soul. The mind can be investigated by sciences and there is no proof of this divine word, this revelation. The human is understood through science, such as biology and anthropology. What would humanist say about society, social responsibility. They would look at certain branches of, society, of science and they would use those in guiding their reason and logic. They might look at social cohesion and order necessary for individuals to, to survive. They might look at communally the responsibilities that they have um, to, to be living together and not necessarily it being a duty if that makes sense. If I was an atheist, what would I be saying? I would be saying that there is definitely no concept of the transcendent. What would I be saying about the human person? That humans have a purpose only in this life and to live a life of personal and social fulfilment and satisfaction for this existence only, that there is nothing after this. This is the best life you're going to live. And what would I say about social responsibility? It's part of caring for others and for our world. And good people do good things for others would be what the atheist was saying. So having quickly gone through a whole lot of the content, which, as I said before, I suggest that you have tables, um, that you put your notes together a couple of times um, and have keywords there that would trigger thoughts in your head around the content because there's a, a tremendous amount to learn and the multiple choice, as you'll see in a minute, um, rely on just small amounts of that. So when you do the HSC paper, you will um, look at multiple choice. You will answer the part questions on religion and non-religion. The part A ones would be religion in Australia post 1945. There would be 10 multiple choice and there will be one five marker. 
What could I do when I answer multiple choice? Obviously, read the questions carefully. Don't just jump in to your choice. Make sure you read all the choices. If you cannot recognise the correct answer, then go through and use the process of elimination. I'm sure lots of these, uh, these things are um, unknown to you. If you do not know the answer, then guess it, but don't ever leave the, the question blank. And if there's stimulus material there, it's there for a purpose. So read it, use it, and try and um, use it to answer your question. So if you were to sit here and to do some multiple choice, um, you could, we could go through these. And I'm, I'm conscious of time, so let's have a look at just a few of them. So this is, these are questions from last year's HSC. Here's our, use the following brochure for questions 12 and 13. So it's welcome to the resort of illumination. During your stay, you'll experience the pleasures of remedial massage, acupuncture and meditation, naturopathic medicines for holistic healing, reflecting readings on the role of the divine and spiritual guidance for searching for souls, for searching souls. The question is, what is the most likely reason for the person to stay at the resort at the time. Would it be because they want to listen to and explore this notion of Mother Earth? Would it be to escape the pressures of social media? Maybe. To study scientific methodologies in, a, in sustainability? Or to satisfy the needs for spiritual and personal fulfilment? And I think if, you, if I was to ask you which one would you choose, I would hope that you all said that this would obviously be some sort of new expression somewhere. Um, and the reason a person would stay there would be for personal fulfillment, to satisfy their spiritual needs. I think when you read the other choices, some of them just sound a little silly. For participating in the resort of illumination activities, a participant would most likely gain which of the following? An insight to some of the practices of this new religious expression in society. You would, you would get that. An ability to transform the health and well-being industry. Not sure that that is realistic. A deeper knowledge of environmental stewardship. Not sure about that one either. A qualification in holistic medicine. I'm sure you're not going to get that. So my my hoping would my hope would be that you all thought that the answer was A. You can see as you go through, if you use that process of elimination, you could normally get rid of two, hopefully three. On which of the following would religious and non-religious worldviews be most likely to differ? Would they differ on the sustainability of the planet? I think when we looked at those tables before, sustainability was important for, for both religious and non-religious worldviews. The existence of a grand design of the universe. I think maybe we differed a little bit around that grand design. The use of scientific methods to find cures for diseases. Not sure that that's correct either. The impact of globalization on living standards in developing countries. I'm not sure that that would be the, that that we would differ on on that as well. I think we probably would differ mostly on B, the existence of this grand design of the universe. And let's just do one more. Which statement best characterizes rational humanism? Is it human nature drives human, in, or sorry, human nature drives human intelligence? Humans drive their moral codes from ancient texts. I'm not sure that that's what the rational humanist would think. Human knowledge is revealed through the supernatural dimension. I think we said before that the rational humanist would be re would be looking at the human person and reason and logic. I'm not sure that that supernatural dimension there fits in with that. Humans rely only on the use of scientific methods for their advancements. I'm not sure that that's correct either. So I think if you had to pick, my choice would be A, and hopefully that was your choice too. Um, there's a few other examples there, and I'll leave those for you to have a look at it some other time. 
Um, this was one of the questions I was talking about where it could be a little difficult to make choices. And, and the question is hard. A selection of countries is shown, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and South Korea. In how many of these countries is Christianity the, um, the religious affiliation of the majority of the population. Now, if you have a look at this, I, I would start going, I would go across and I think Australia, predominantly Christian. New Zealand, predominantly Christian. Singapore, I don't think Christian. South Korea of, I think South Korea has an issue with um, no affiliations, no major affiliations but the biggest group there would be Christian. So my answer here is C for the reasons that are there below. But you can see that unless you knew specifically about Singapore and you knew specifically about South Korea, it might, that might be difficult for you to answer. There's the answers. Um, the other part of the... Um, paper for religion and non-religion is a five marker. So when you're answering a five marker, you need to answer the question and you need to do it in a relatively short space of, of paper and time. So what would I do when I'm answering a question? I'd attack the question and I'd unpack it. And I would advocate for you scribbling on the paper so that you don't make any mistakes. So the first thing I would do is um, identify the instructional term. Is it identify, is it outline, is it explain? What is the question asking you to do? Words that relate to the subject area being studied or the topic words, and often there's two lots of topic words. Um, it might be this guides something else. Um, the limiting words, so it might say and or with reference to the quote might be, um, or with reference to the diagram, just draws your, I like that idea of it, draws your, um, your understanding of the question to making sure that you don't do those things or you do do certain things. And this glue word um, is, is the thing that holds the question together. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. So they're just some tips on answering short answer questions. Read the questions carefully. Attack the questions or unpack it. And I'm sure different um, schools do different things when they're unpacking the question. It's short and to the point. It's not an essay. You answer the question in the first sentence and then you give, you know, your evidence or um, explain further in, in the, the base of your paragraph. Remember, I always say to the students that I teach that the score and the number of lines allowed are, are indicative. And so if you think a question is worth five marks and you wrote one sentence, I'm not sure that that's going to get you your five marks. So make sure that the amount of content that you write in answering the question properly, and I'm not talking about waffle, unnecessary words, but the words that are going to be the content that's necessary, make sure that reflects what the question's worth. And then incorporate relevant examples. The most important thing in your five marker short answer questions, you need to have examples. And last year's question 22, how can the religious dimension provide meaning and purpose for the individual? How can it is our instructional word. We're asking about religious dimension and how it provides meaning and purpose. Who for? The individual. So how can the religious dimension provide meaning and purpose for the individual? And where does that fit in the syllabus? It goes back to the beginning of where we spoke about meaning and purpose and the religious dimension at the beginning of the syllabus. So what do I need to know? I think it's really important that you know your content and you know your syllabus so that when you see a question, your brain instantly thinks, oh, this is about the religious dimension, meaning and purpose. These were the notes I had on it, or this is my knowledge of the content that I need to put in this question and this answer. Um, if I was marking this question, it provides a detailed and accurate explanation of how religious dimension provides meaning and purpose to the individual. It needs to be clear and it needs to be relevant and you need to make sure that you're using accurate terminology. Let's not worry about the other, the other marks because everybody's going to get five out of five. And then we answer the question. So here's a sample answer. 
um, that Mike came from. You can find these sample answers in the, um, the markers response on the NESA website. So let's have a look at what, what they wrote here. Religiously founded beliefs in the meaning and purpose of life strengthen the capacity for the individual to cope with stress and adversity. So straight away it's saying religious beliefs provide meaning and purpose by allowing or helping the individual to cope with stress and ad adversity. The religious dimension also incorporates moral guidance for individuals seeking to discover their meaning and purpose through the role modelling of key religious individuals. So it provides guidance by looking at, you could also add here sacred texts or key religious figures who provide guidance for individuals. For example, this can be seen in Christianity where Pope Francis's views on the environment through Luade C promote opportunities for social cohesion and transformation within society. So Pope Francis has spoken out, and there's my example. Pope Francis has spoken out about the environment and the importance of us looking after our environment. His voice has drawn people together, um, in particularly the Catholic um, denomination have brought people together and hopefully will change our society. If, if we all have this same view of the importance of our environment. Individuals are therefore empowered through the meaning and, through meaning and purpose presented by the religious dimension. It contributes to the adherent's desire to make a positive contribution to society. So how is it doing that? By making me feel part of that group and contribute to society in a positive way. And social cohesion as an agent of reform in the struggle for many social justice issues, including poverty, um, racial and gender equality, and the care of the elderly. I think if you read that, you would have to think that this, this answer gives me five marks. They've very clearly outlined the importance of how meaning and purpose um, of life, how religious beliefs create or, or help individuals in this providing meaning and purpose in my life. Um, what were some of the notes from the markers? It's not it's worth you, I think, when you're looking at some of the past HSC responses, to have a look at what the markers said at the marking centre, because sometimes those things might be hints for you on how to respond or how to improve your answers to questions. So the better responses, students, were able to clearly and accurately identify ways in which the religious dimension can provide meaning and purpose. I think clearly and accurately is really important. Presents a detailed explanation using a range of examples, such as ethical guidance and an understanding of, of um, the ultimate reality. So clear and, accurate ident um, clear and accurate response, detailed explanation using a range of examples, areas for students to improve on, detailed examples. So obviously, in the responses last year, people needed to remember to give examples and that would have helped you with the, the rest of the answer in moving you up towards a, a five marks from the religious dimension to demonstrate how it provides meaning and purpose. You, you need to provide the example and show how it provides meaning and purpose. Let's do another one. This one was the 2020 paper. How might a theist, so that's a person who believes in gods, and an atheist differ in their viewpoint. And the quote was, it takes a greater mind to find God and to use him. Where does this come from? It comes from looking at our non-religious worldviews in the syllabus. So I'm starting to think about what an atheist is and about um, the common features that an atheist would exhibit. A theist being a religious person, I then might be thinking about my Christianity in the table, about my religious worldview. Provide a detailed and accurate explanation of both an atheist and a theist view of the quote. We won't worry about the others because we're all going to get five. Here's our example. Theists and atheists have fundamentally opposed, fundamentally opposed worldviews. While theists embrace the challenge of accepting the existence of the transcendent and of God's agency in human society so that God works through people, atheists reject this as a superstitious belief. 
Atheists argue that there is no evidence of God or of a transcendent aspect to reality. Therefore, belief in a higher power than humanity actually limits human um, autonomy. Atheists would argue that it takes a greater mind to assess personal behaviour, moral and ethical frameworks based on referred outcomes and social responsibilities than it does to outsource responsibility for this behaviour to religious institutions. Theists, however, would argue that the transcendent nature of God is a mystery that should be embraced. The capacity of the human mind to expand when, it, when in contact with the divine agency would be, for theists, evidence that only greater minds can find God. So I think clearly they've outlined the differences between the atheist and the theist, and then they've made reference to the quote and um, the capacity of the, the human mind here in the last part, in the last sentence, the capacity of the human mind to expand when in contact with the divine would be for those that believe in the supernatural evidence that only greater minds can find God, that he works through us or through others. Um, what they say here in terms of marking, clearly distinguished between a theistic and atheistic worldview, such as Christianity and, and agnostic, demonstrated the difference in worldviews using a range of examples. Where do we need to improve? Integrating aspects of the quote into the argument and articulating a clear argument. If you didn't have that argument, you would end up not being in um, that five range. There's a few more examples in there, and I'm just conscious of time and that we're nearly out of time, um, that you can go through and have a look at. Um, I would urge you to do as many of these questions as you can. Um, have a look at the marks from the marking, the comments from the marking centre, it will help you. Um, and if anybody has any questions, if you wanted to put those in the chat, um, at the back of this PowerPoint, there's uh, a blank slide, and I will put those questions on there with answers um, to help everyone. So it was nice to be with you this afternoon. I hope that's helped in some way. Um, good luck in your studying and in, in the rest of your assessment tasks and in your HSC. I wish you well. Thank you. Kathy, thank you very much. Um, I just um, reiterate that if you've got any um, questions, the Q and A buttons down below, you can put them in there, and Kathy will answer them. But Kathy, thanks for sharing your wisdom and insights. Um, a lot of what you explained, I can see in the world around us. And I'm not studying this this subject, but um, I can see that, um, and I think it's good to reflect on our own belief system, just me personally, and to, to look at it from that that angle is um, is quite intriguing. And I really love the, the tables. I'm a big um, supporter of them as well. Um, yeah, thank you for your time today. That was very comprehensive. Thank you. We'll just give a, another moment or two if there's any questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, these videos or this video and the others from this week will go up. They'll be a bit delayed, but they'll be up before next Wednesday's session. So you'll be able to look at them on the Mission Identity YouTube channel. Um, they'll also be linked in on the Studies of Religion Google site that we have. Um, and yeah, thank you all for being involved. And Kathy, thank you for your time as well and for your expertise. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And um, you all take care. Thank you very much.